thank you everyone for joining us, especially those of you coming from North America where um, it's it's a little bit early in the morning. Um, and so we're, we're very excited today to kick off day two of the IEIP, um, the uh, EIP's annual virtual conference um, with a really interesting panel on uh, voter identification in the uh, UK context. Um, and so as, as many of you know, um, voter ID has been in place in Northern Ireland in, for many years, but not necessarily in Britain. Um, and so May was the first time it was introduced and uh, it's set to be compulsory for the next UK general election. Um, and so it's been a, a very contentious issue in the news um, and among academics and practitioners, um, just like it has been in, in the American context where we've seen lots of I talk about claims of voter suppression on one side of the political aisle, but then also this, this question of, is it necessary then to prevent um, electoral fraud? Um, and so that's the kind of discussion that we're going to be having today. Um, we have a great panel of um, scholars and practitioners. Um, and as the EIP, uh, we love to focus on bringing academic together and bringing the academic evidence together and bringing the partners together. Um, so EMBs, academics, practitioners, civil society groups. So we have representation from all of those today uh, for the panel. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll kick it off with um, some presentations. We have five presentations from different stakeholders. Um, and uh, from there, we will be able to um, move on to a bit of a Q&A and discussion period, um, which I'm really looking forward to. So we're gonna um, get everything started off um, hearing from the Electoral Commission. Um, so we have Phil Thompson with us today from the Electoral Commission to take, to take a look through the 2023 local elections in Britain. So Phil, I will let you uh, share your screen and, and take it from there, thanks. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so hopefully everyone um, can see some slides, um, excellent. Um, so, as Holly said, uh, I'm Phil, I'm from the UK Electoral Commission, um, Head of Research. Um, just for those who don't know, um, the Commission in the UK doesn't run elections, um, but one of our roles is very much to scrutinise and report on how well um, elections are run. Um, and then obviously with voter ID, that's one of the things that we've been uh, busy doing. So you'll see this is badged as our interim analysis, um, that's largely because uh, we always publish reports on polls, uh, scheduled sets of elections, usually in the autumn, and we're going to be doing that again this year. But because of the interest in, in voter ID, we thought it was very useful to put out some kind of key statistics, mostly focused on the impact on the voter at this point. So not so much on some of the implementation side, which I think some of the other panelists will talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about what we think the kind of headline key findings are um, from May, and also a little bit about why we think we're seeing what we're seeing. Um, and then a little bit about what we're going to do uh, next. So, if I can make the slide move on. Um, so, we collected, uh, or polling station staff um, on the 4th of May, when the local elections were happening in England, had to record data on the voters that came in, um, tried to vote, but weren't able to because of the ID requirement. Um, so, they had to record both when the voter was turned away, but also if they came back later in the day. Um, and then they had to report that data back, back into us. Uh, so this is based on information from the 230 local authorities that were running polls. Um, so we saw that 0.7% of polling station voters were initially turned away, so turned away at least once during polling day, but about two thirds of them at some point during polling day came back. Um, and that left by the close of poll, about 0.25% of anyone who tried to vote in a polling station uh, who wasn't issued with a ballot paper. So a relatively small proportion, but with an electorate of 27 million, that still means that you've got about 14,000 people um, who had gone to a polling station but weren't given a ballot paper. There was quite a lot of discussion uh, before polling day about uh, this data and what we would know and what the role would be of some staff that were acting as greeters or marshals in polling stations. So people who were there to provide voters with information, but would all also be reminding them and asking them if they had ID. This data was being captured at the desk where you'd be issued with a ballot paper. If the greeter obviously met someone at a door and said, have you remembered your driving license? And they said, no, they weren't very likely to go to the desk and be recorded. They would probably leave. Um, and uh, we collected data on stations that had greeters and didn't have greeters. 
and that effect is exactly what unsurprisingly we've seen so the proportion of people recorded as being turned away at polling stations with greeting staff was lower at 0.55 percent than the stations that didn't have greeters where it was 0.8 percent and you you then have that overall average of 0.7 so the concern about greeters and what's been captured in this data is perfectly reasonable um, and it was an accurate concern I think it's a slight red herring maybe in the sense that this data was never going to be a totally accurate assessment of what the impact was of voter ID. It was always going to be an underestimate for a variety of reasons, not least because some people will just never leave their house because they've, they're have they concerned about the ID requirement. They think they can't meet the ID requirement rightly or wrongly, or maybe they're just reminded about it on the way to the polling station before they before they get there. So we were always concerned that relying solely on this data would potentially underestimate the impact. And that was one of the reasons why we also then conducted um, a public opinion survey in the areas with elections. Uh, and we asked people whether they voted or not. And if they told us they didn't vote, we asked them why. And in the first instance, um, that was an unprompted question where they could give any response they wanted. And then obviously it was coded afterwards. Um, and these are the results or some of the results. Um, I think the key things, two key things really are the main reasons for people not voting are the same as they always are. Um, and these, the pattern is, is virtually identical to what we usually see around lack of time or lack of interest um, in the polls. But this year we did get a proportion of people, 4% of those non-voters, giving a reason that related to the ID requirement. So for most of them, it was because they said they didn't have ID or at least thought they didn't have ID. And for a smaller proportion, 1%, it was because they uh, actively disagreed with the policy and chose not to vote because of that. So 4% overall of non-voters coding the ID requirement as a reason for not voting. We then asked the same set of non-voters a prompted question where we asked them which of uh, this set of statements uh, best matched their experience. And again, for the vast majority of people, it didn't have anything to do with ID. It was, uh, I didn't want to vote or it's a different reason. But for a proportion, in this case, 7%, they gave us, a, again, a reason related to ID. Now, I think that's probably exactly what we would expect to see where the prompted question is getting a higher result than the unprompted one. And our aim, really, between the polling station data and these two public opinion questions was to try and effectively triangulate where roughly the overall impact might sit um, for, from the ID policy um, and accepting that there's probably a degree of uncertainty in this, but that probably it's in and around where that unprompted question figure is giving us. So it might not be 4%, it could be 2%, 3%, but it's in that ballpark. I think that's, that was uh, the conclusion that we're kind of getting to. Um, one of the other things that we will be doing, which we haven't really got into yet, is these are obviously headline figures. They're gonna vary for different groups across society. So that's something that we will be looking at between now and, and when we're publishing our um, full report in September. Um, so that's really the key, what we think the key impact has been on voters from May, but it's a crucial question about why we think that has happened. And one of the obvious um, uh, reasons may be around whether people knew that they had to bring ID or not. So we did look at, uh, at public awareness, not least because we have a role in uh, running public awareness campaigns to, to tell people that they need to bring ID, that they need to register to vote, things like that. Um, awareness was very low. Uh, at the end of last year. Obviously, in, in England, you, you've never had to do this before, but it did steadily increase, and it was quite high, really, by the time we got to polling day. So that headline level of awareness, 87%, 92% of people who knew that they needed to bring ID to vote. Um, and that's relative to other things that we see is a really high result. I mean, 85% of people in our most recent survey knew you needed to be registered to vote rather than just turn up on the day. So you're in and around possibly the maximum that you might see, um, but it isn't 100%. So if you're looking for reasons why some people have, have turned up and not been able to vote, not everyone knew that you needed to bring ID. And in particular, it was lower, the awareness levels were lower among certain groups. So again, we're doing a bit more work to look into this, particularly thinking about our own campaigns work, but younger people were less likely to know in general, people from black minority ethnic communities were less likely to know, um, and possibly unsurprisingly, those that said they never voted in local elections were less likely to know. 
Um, those awareness levels are still relatively high, but they're lower than that headline level. And again, they're not 100%. And then crucially, they're much lower for people that we know didn't have any of the accepted ID types. So we also asked people whether they had certain ID types in the survey, and those that didn't have any of them, their awareness of the, of the requirement was much lower. The solution for them was a, a freely available ID that was um, made available through local authorities. You could apply for it. There was no cost um, except for the admin cost of supplying a photo and filling in the form. Um, but uh, because there is this group of, uh, of people that, that don't have ID, and that's just some statistics, just to, as a reminder, we know that from our own research and others that about 4% of people um, didn't have any of the accepted photo ID types. And again, that varied and was much higher among certain groups um, in society. So the free local ID, which was uh, called the, is called the Voter Authority Certificate, um, was available to anyone then who didn't have any of the existing forms. Given the size of the electorate and that 4% figure, we had estimated that anywhere between 250,000 to 350,000 applications for a Voter Authority Certificate would be needed if everyone wanted to vote. Um, that's definitely not what we saw. There were about 90,000 applications ahead of the deadline on the 25th of April, um, and actually only 25,000 voter authority certificates were used on the 4th of May. Um, really importantly, I think, awareness of the voter authority certificate was not as high as the overall awareness of the requirement. And it was pretty low for the overall population, which is maybe understandable because for most people, they don't actually need to know about it. If you have a driving license or a passport, you would never need a voter authority certificate, but it was also pretty low for people that didn't have any ID. So in both cases, 57% um, in our survey of people were aware that you could apply for, for one of these um, ID types. And that, as we say on the slide, just basically means that just under half of people who didn't have any ID also didn't know they could have got something that would have let them vote on polling day. Um, and if we're trying to look at why that pro overall proportion of maybe 4% weren't able to vote, I think this is certainly um, one of the pieces of evidence about, um, about who those people might be. Um, just to take a slightly different look at it, one of the obvious potential benefits around introducing something like voter ID as a, as a safeguard and additional security measure is about bolstering public confidence um, and the, the public's experience of, of voting. Um, these are all questions that we always ask on our public opinion surveys. They're not ones we've introduced. Um, and we've looked at this year and the last time these local elections, this set of local elections happened in 2019. And really, I think the story is that there's not much to tell. Um, there hasn't been much change really in either that headline level of confidence or any of our measures of satisfaction or indeed how safe people think um, voting at a polling station is. So no real evidence of a, of a sort of a bounce, if you like, in terms of public confidence yet. Um, but that's obviously something else that we're going to be um, looking at in a bit more detail over the next few months. And then just to finish, um, as I've said a few times, we've got more work to do on this. There's quite a lot of data um, available. Um, there's some stuff we've already got in, like our public opinion uh, data, but there's also feedback from uh, others that we gather after a poll. So in particular, returning officers and electoral administrators about their experience of administering and uh, you know, implementing this as a, as a requirement, but also civil society organizations, both ones that we work with, um, but also um, anyone who's working in the sort of field of supporting different groups in society to, to vote, to register and to vote. Um, and we want to understand what, they, what their experience was in terms of their uh, members and their customers and what barriers they faced. And that's going to be particularly important for getting under the skin a bit more of um, that differential impact uh, point that I mentioned before. And we're also going to be getting feedback from candidates and campaigners as well about whether there was any impact uh, on them from the new requirement. The really crucial thing for us is obviously to look ahead. Um, in September, we will most likely be making any recommendations about whether we think there are changes that need to be made uh, in terms of the policy. And that's really going to be focused on the elections that are going to happen probably in 2024 in both cases. So probably, well, definitely a set of scheduled elections in May 2024, which will include elections in London, which we didn't have this year, and also in Wales, which we didn't have this year. But also really importantly, 
at the next general election, whereas Holly said at the start, this requirement will apply for the first time as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for, for that insight uh, from, from the Electoral Commission. Um, we're going to move now over to some academic evidence. Um, and so I'll, I'll pass it over to Alistair Clark and Toby James, um, coming to us from Newcastle University and the University of East Anglia. Um, and so feel free to take it away and I'll definitely let you guys know if you are over time. <laughs> I'll be ruthless with you guys. Okay, uh, go for it. I have no doubt that you will. Um, okay, so th thank you, everyone. Thank you, Phil, for the opening presentation. And I try not to repeat too many of the similar sort of, sort of themes in, in some ways. Um, so the presentation um, is a kind of reflects a, a working paper that's a work in progress, looking at the effects of the voter ID using the perspective of poll workers and what what really the experience is inside the polling station. So just to, by way of a kind of broad context, um, voter ID really is a big issue in terms of when we're trying to design electoral institutions. And one of the reasons why this is so difficult is that when we're trying to design and run elections, we're often trying to uh, deliver many competing goals. So this is both security uh, for the voter and the voting process, but also participation. It's sometimes suggested uh, that they are in conflict with each other and maybe there is some, some sort of kind of, kind of trade-off. So obviously the UK hasn't, this is all new for the UK, we haven't been down this this part, uh, path before for a UK general election, so this is particularly important in terms of in terms of where we're going uh, for, for, for the future. But we have had um, pilots of the vote, of, of these um, of voter ID in the past. So what we're going to bring through in the presentation is um, an update, if you like, of um, some of the perspectives of poll workers building on some of the sort of longer to do work that Alistair and I have done on, on, on poll workers. So, so just to bring in some of, some of the literature, um, there's been a lot of research on voter ID, not in the UK, but mostly uh, in the US, that tends to note that it can have a negative effect on terms of, of turnout. And one of the contradictions in some of the studies is how much this there, the decline is and if there is any kind of kind of decline and also the extent to which um, some marginalized groups um, can can particularly be affected so there are there's a constant of contradiction there in terms of what we what we've known we know already though from from the pilots that people are less likely to some people do not vote because of the um vote identify Voter identification requirements, and there's been two parts to that. One is difficulty of accessing the ID. One is a sort of out of principle, people deciding to not provide the forms of identification. So this isn't this isn't new. And there's also a range um, of other studies, and I'm not going to repeat these because that our colleagues can kind of will obviously present those themselves here. But it's still pretty fresh in terms of what the evidence is. In terms, of, in terms of voter ID. And just to also say by way of background, there are other problems at poll elections in the UK too. Broadly speaking, elections are run very well, but maybe the bigger issue um, that, as we shall see, is also the voter registration issue in terms of, as the Electoral Commission has shown, there's a very large number of people, up to 9 million people, who are either missing from the Electoral Register or not correctly re registered at the Electoral Register. And some of our previous studies have shown that they these people often turn up at, on, on, on the poll on the day of the polls and are unable to cast their, their votes. So we'll keep the theory brief and short. Um, but broadly speaking, um, what we what we do in, in the paper um, is we used a human ref reflexivity approach, which is something that Holly and I are kind of working on at the moment. And this basically is kind of how it starts from the principles that electoral laws have really important consequences in terms of in terms of voters they really affect uh, the incentives for whether people vote or do not vote because they increase the costs of time for them participating so these are really important but at the same time actually laws are one thing actually how uh, actors respond to this is also particularly important one of the reasons why you might not get a decline in voter turnout for example is because uh, civil society groups can mobilize to get the vote out and actually you don't see that decline um, take um, um, witness at the polling stations 
The other important aspect of this is the importance of um, the actual administration of this. So you can have voter ID laws, but what is absolutely crucial here is actually how they're administered on the ground. And we now know after 20 years of, of research post uh, the kind of Florida US uh, kind of crisis, how important things like resources and training and, and, and so on are for the actual administration of, of, of elections. Uh, and so that any laws, therefore, in practice are going to be absolutely dependent on sufficient resources, training, management, good practices there. So what we do is ask two questions. What effect did voter ID have in terms of hindering participation? But also looking at some of the poll workers to think about, well, what other issues are, in, are involved? Uh, what other types of problems uh, um, occur? So we use a survey of poll workers. Um, this was administered um, by um, the Electoral Commission. Um, so, uh, you know, sincerest thanks to them. It was an online survey that that um, was sent across all local authorities. Um, so it is kind of an opt-in survey. Overall, we had two, over two and a half thousand responses. We're doing data tidy up at the moment um, because people manually entered their um, their local authority name, but we know that there are at least over 50 local authorities rep represented in this. And what we're covering here represents the provisional results at the moment. So we're going to be writing this up and we'll make the paper available in full. And importantly, I, th I think as Phil mentions, what we're covering, what we're looking at here are what goes on inside the polling stations, not what goes on prior to the polling stations. And therefore, it, this underestimates the effect of voter ID in terms of participation uh, and we need other studies like those that, that I think Petra is going to, going to introduce here as well to get the get the broader picture and these things kind of importantly fit together. And I'm going to hand over now to, to Alistair who's going to, to take us um, through the results. And we have the first unmute mishap of them all, mate. Um, <laughs> right. Um, thanks, Toby. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'll, I'll be um, asking you to turn over slides in, in due course. This, the slide that um, we've put up here, just to link in, is, is really for context. Um, and this is from studies that, that Toby and I have done of poll workers in the past 2015 general election, 2018 locals, 2016 Scottish Parliament election. And although 70 odd percent of polling station workers um, suggest that training spent enough time covering electoral law and procedures, um, Actually, worthy of note is that between 15 and 19% and consistently say that election law is too complex and uh, to understand quickly and, and easily. And I think this is important context for going into um, the, the study of poll workers because there's already a degree of, of confusion. It may not be with all poll workers by any manner of means, but there is a degree of confusion out there as to electoral law. That's one of the broader problems with, with the UK elections, but uh, I'll not dwell on that particular one here. Um, next slide, Toby. Thanks. OK, so who were our respondents? Um, with a mix of respondents, obviously, with a kind of 62-38 um, split between urban and rural um, respondents. The, the sex of the responding poll worker was pretty much as we've seen before in a poll worker studies. In other words, roughly about two thirds female, a third male. Um, with a mixture of different seniority in respondents, polling clerks um, are the those just you know helping out, taking names and so on. Presiding officers are the the ones that in polling stations with responsibility for ensuring their station runs okay and and have decisional um, responsibility as as well. With a few or a far smaller number rather of um, what have been called greeters, um, only 4.2% of, of those responding. But polling clerks, presiding officers, um, a, a decent um, set of responses from those. Now, I think it's worth pointing out 
that this is a reasonably experienced workforce. This is not um, a group of people who have never worked at elections before. And indeed, um, over four fifths of them saying that they, they'd actually worked at a polling station before. Um, from a previous surveys of polling station workers, often they've worked at, at quite a lot of elections before, but we don't have um, a figure for that in um, this particular data. Nevertheless, there's a degree of experience. So there may be on the one hand, a degree of confusion about electoral law, um, but there is still a degree of experience um, in working at election time amongst those that were working uh, on the 4th of May in polling stations for the local elections. Now, We've already mentioned, the Toby's already mentioned the issue around training, and um, we, we did ask whether or not um, respondents had attended training. Um, the answer was pretty much um, universally yes, 97.7% of respondents saying they'd attended training. Um, the question arises, next slide, Toby, um, of what kind of training that was, however. And I think there's this. Um, room for concern here, I think, in relation to the type of training that's been delivered. We gave them various options um, via a link to a recorded video presentation online by video conference, by Zoom teams or, or whatever, in person or other. And what we see from this response, fairly obviously from the screen, is that this was via a link to a recorded video presentation that could be watched in um, their own time. Second largest response in that question was um, online by video conference. In other words, the, the type of in-person training that took place before the pandemic and, and tended to be the, the main form of training for polling station workers was, was only the third most used type of training delivery for polling station workers. Now, I think anyone who's a university lecturer looking in at this or, or, or listening to this will know of the difficulties of teaching anyone anything online by, by Zooms or, or Teams, um, let alone having um, someone um, link to a recorded video or, or presentation. So th this is why I say I think there's scope here for concern about the, the training and, and that's being delivered, but, but we need a bit more information about this, which unfortunately we don't have at the moment, but, but something there, I think, a flag there for us to investigate in future. Toby, thank you. Okay, Toby's already mentioned that in, in some of our previous work on poll workers, we, we've talked about the, the number of times various issues have been um, a, been a problem in polling stations. And we've, we've asked about people being turned away who are not the electoral register, personation, um, those um, various other things. And what we see here with those two questions, people not on the electoral register, the same sort of pattern that we normally do. Um, this really um, probably the biggest problem up until now we, we've had in polling stations. Unsurprisingly, suspected cases of personation, um, minimal. 99.2% um, polling stations saying there were very few cases of this. There were no cases of, of personation, only um, you know, a handful of respondents saying there were any cases. Some um, concern, 4.9% had think they would won a bit of evidence of um, people trying to influence how others voted, otherwise, otherwise often known in British context as family voting, 3.1% um, of respondents saying they, they don't want more than that. Um, and of course, as we've already heard, people being turned away because they didn't have the, the appropriate identification. Um, only 29.5% of respondents having no examples of that. There'll be next slide, please. Okay, other um, experiences on the day. 53% of respondents had no greeter or marshal. In other words, someone out there pointing people to the right polling station, reminding them whether or not they, they had ID, that kind of thing. Um, the significance of this, as Phil mentioned, is that 
that it was only when um, they got to the actual polling station desk that that um, was, was recorded. I'll skip over some of these because Holly's given me red flags and, and things of that sort, because there's a few other things that I quickly want to. Um, Alistair, you just went on mute again. There we go. Um, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Toby, next slide, please. Okay, very quickly. When were people turned away? Um, respondents saying um, essentially outside the polling station or before they got to the desk. So the significance of that, those greeters and so on, I think very important. Um, only about 15% saying that people were being turned away um, at the desk. In other words, we don't, it's that point about it being an underestimate that Phil was talking about earlier on. This could be, a, you know, quite a significant underestimate. Um, Toby, next slide. Um, were there queues? Yes, there were. Um, a, a little longer than um, we've had in previous elections. Bear in mind, this is a low turnout local election. When we come to a general election, then we're going to experience bigger queues. Next slide, Toby. Um, overall experience, um, well, 43, 44% saying that this was about the same as previous elections, and bear in mind they have experience of running previous elections. But about 40% um, saying this was a bit more difficult, and 4 or 5% saying this was a lot more difficult. So this has, has made running elections um, more difficult, I think, to some degree than they have otherwise been. Toby, last slide, I think. Um, okay, low turnout elections for local elections. I think we can safely say that limited to some degree the problems on, on the day. But clearly there were significant problems experienced. Now, how you define significant is the obvious um, question there. But it has introduced um, a, you know, delays in processing voters. Um, it has introduced the issue of, of people being turned away and us not actually knowing for obvious reasons what the, 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 the full number of this is. Scale this up to a general election, that point's already been made, but I think there's, there's a far larger difficulty or set of difficulties in the offing here. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for your forbearance for me running over time. <laughs> Thanks, Alistair and Toby. That's great. Let's move right along to our, our second pack of the set of academics. Um, we have Petra Schleiter from uh, University of Oxford. Uh, this is co-authored, I believe, with Jonathan Homola and Margaret Tavitz. Um, and they're going to be looking at the mandatory voter ID and its effect on voter attitudes and behaviors. Um, so Petra, if you'd like to share your screen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. There we go. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Holly. Yeah. Um, and thank you for including us uh, in the conference. So I'm, I'm Petra Schleiter. I'm based at the University of Oxford, but this is co-authored work with Jonathan Homola, who's actually on the call, and Margaret Tavitz. Um, and we are interested in the effects of voter ID on the attitudes and behavior of voters. And as Holly said, this is academic research. And in a sense, we're coming at this question um, in a way that's a little bit different from Phil and Alistair and Toby. Um, we're all trying to sort of work out the same effects on voters, but we're looking at it slightly differently. I'll give you a bit of background and then I say how our study differs a little bit from the other ones. And I think together we're all getting uh, quite a coherent picture, which is nice. So we were interested in the study of voter ID in, and its introduction in the UK because this is a broader trend, as Holly has already um, said in the introduction. Um, there are current debates about introducing or tightening uh, mandatory voter ID in a whole range of countries around the world, and um, that affects around a billion voters worldwide. Um, mostly the effects of voter ID have been studied in the US, and so the UK is a new context to try and understand this. And the first implementation was in the local elections in May 2023. 
Um, we know that voter ID can affect voter attitudes and behavior. And in fact, voter ID was justified by the government in this country as a measure to combat electoral fraud and to increase election integrity and voter confidence in the electoral process. This is the same justification that's generally given in other countries too. And generally, opponents of voter ID highlight potentially adverse behavioral and attitudinal implications, such as reduced turnout, um, reduced perceptions of electoral fairness, or possibly even reduced confidence in elections. So we just wanted to know how does the introduction of voter ID in the UK affect uh, electoral behavior and attitudes? And prior work, as Toby has already indicated, is a little bit contradictory. So what we know about attitudes when voter ID is introduced um, is that voters think that ID laws prevent fraud. So we see that both on, in research um, on the US and in the UK. But we also know that media coverage of rare fraud in order to explain why voter ID is being introduced increases concerns about fraud and decreases confidence in elections. And we know that in the US, states, voters in states with and without voter ID do not differ in their confidence in elections or perceptions of impersonation fraud, which is really interesting. When it comes to behavior, we know um, that globally, photo voter ID requirements correlate with reduced turnout, but that's a correlation only. We've got some research um, in the US and Australia, which suggests that um, voter ID negatively impacts turnout among racial and ethnic minorities, but that research has been questioned on methodological grounds. Other work, however, finds no evidence of demobilization in the aggregate US electorate or amongst Democrats. So then thinking about what mechanisms may be at play here, it could be that voters respond to the introduction um, of ID for, their, for various different reasons. So one reason may be priming. It may be that they identify with certain parties and these parties take positions on voter ID, which primes partisan identities and may then polarize voters um, in their perception about voter ID. Um, or it may be simply that there are information effects. So as Phil mentioned, the Electoral Commission has run an information campaign to simply inform voters that ID is coming, and that may change their perceptions of elections. <clears throat> or it may be experimental, experiential effects that are at play here. So as voters actually go to the polls and experience the change, that may change their perception of elections and also their behavior. Um, I'll come back to these effect, uh, these mechanisms as we look at the effects. So just in terms of the research design, here is the biggest difference between um, the study that Phil introduced and also that Alistair and Toby talked about and our study. So we wanted to understand how is the same population um, that voted in 2022 in the English local elections affected in 2023 by the introduction of um, voter ID. So we want to have a baseline, which is 2022. We want to look at the same people who voted in 2022 or were able to vote in 2022 and were eligible to vote in 2023. So we're looking at uh, pre and post election surveys that we ran in all English local authorities that held local elections in 2022 and 2023. These are not panel studies, they're independent surveys because panel attrition is, is an issue. We, um, we had quota samples in order to ensure uh, representativeness of, of the population that we were sampling in terms of gender, age, ethnicity, urbanicity, and education. We focused on the 23 um, local authorities with elections in both years. And um, that's, that's just a, a subset of the 317 local authorities that we have um, overall. We ran the surveys if they were pre-election in the two weeks prior to the election, if they were post-election in the two weeks after the election. In total, we had over 6,000 respondents. And in the individual surveys, um, the number of respondents ranged from 1,300 to 1,700. And our outcome measures were both behavioral, so that's self-reported turnout, um, and attitudes, that is perceptions of the integrity of elections, fairness, um, barriers to participation and overall satisfaction with elections. 
And this design, because we survey people pre-election and post-election, allows us to differentiate between the effect pre-election of just information about voter ID and post-election exposure to it. Okay, so I'll present a series of figures now. Um, and I'll always present first um, the figure that gives you an impression of the effect or of the of the uh, yeah of the effect in the overall population, the six thousand respondents. We have the baseline here: pre-election 2022 survey, post-election 2022 survey, and then after the introduction of voter ID, we have 2023 pre-election and 2023 post-election. And then I'll always present. Um, first of all, the 6,000 overall, and then we'll break it down into conservative and labor voters because we're interested in these partisan priming effects as well. So turning first to self-reported turnout, and remember this is self-reported, this is always inflated, but what we see is quite interesting. We see quite a significant um, decline post-election of self-reported turnout by about um, 10%. Um, and that decline is actually consistent whether voters are conservative voters or labor voters. These two curves move approximately in parallel. If we ask, and, and this is very similar to what uh, Phil and the Electoral Commission did, if we ask why people didn't turn out, then of course in 2022, we see hardly anyone saying they didn't have photo ID because it wasn't required. But in 2023, it's a significant reason for choosing not to turn out. And interestingly, if anyone is, uh, feels more affected by the requirement of voter ID, it's conservative voters who are recorded here in blue, um, rather than labor voters, although post-election, those two groups are exactly um, at the same point here. So both groups um, uh, report being affected by the ID requirement. Now we're turning to attitudes and um, and how how easy or difficult people perceive it um, to be to commit fraud. And it's very clear that people um, perceive it as less easy to commit fraud. That's exactly what we would expect with the uh, introduction of voter ID. And if anyone is more affected by uh, by this, it's labor voters. But in both groups, we see a decline um, of the perceived ease of committing fraud. But then when we ask about whether people perceive uh, fraud as a problem, it's clear that they perceive fraud more as a problem after the introduction of voter ID. And this is actually consistent with the research that we've seen in the US, that talking a lot about fraud in the context of the introduction of voter ID makes people perceive fraud as more of a problem. And this is very interesting because again, it's sort of the same trend for both groups, labor and conservative voters. Then when we turn to the perceived ease of voting, it is clear that respondents perceive voting as more difficult after the introduction of voter ID. That too is exactly the same for conservative and labor voters, although these two groups start from different priors. So in general, conservative voters seem to think it's easier to vote than labor voters, but in both groups, there's this very marked decline in how easy or difficult they perceive it to be to vote. When we look at perceived equality and fairness of the election, that seems to decline as well compared to 2022. And again, we see that decline in both groups, conservative and labor voters, although it's a little bit more pronounced among labor voters, and this is exactly as we would expect it to be. And then we come to the summary measure, which is in a sense satisfaction with voting overall. And we see that that declines post introduction of voter ID, and we see that decline a little bit more pronounced among labor voters than among conservative voters, but the decline is evident in both groups. So in terms of conclusions, we see clear effects on behavior, at least in terms of self-reported turnout. It'll be very interesting to see whether that um, also translates into verified turnout, and there's clearly more work to be done. In terms of attitudes, we see clear effects in terms of the perceived resilience of elections to fraud that's increased. But at the same time, we also see that people perceive fraud as more of a problem and that they perceive that the barriers to voting have been raised. And they perceive equality and fairness to have declined and voting satisfaction overall has declined. So we see attitudinal uh, effects moving in both directions. In terms of the mechanisms that I mentioned earlier, we see informational effects in the pre-election survey in 2023. 
and experiential effects in the post-election survey in 2023, we see relatively little evidence of partisan priming and partisan polarization so far over the introduction of voter ID. So what are the implications then for policy evaluation? Um, so in terms of uh, behavioral effects, and this is obviously subject to uh, further work on, on uh, verified turnout, but there seems to be a behavioral cost. There seems to be a cost of the voter ID reform in terms of reducing turnout intentions and, and self-reported turnout. In terms of the attitudinal effects, we asked, well, were there benefits that the government intended for perceived electoral integrity? And I think the answer here is a little bit unclear because on the one hand, we see the perceived um, increased resilience to fraud, but then at the same time, we, we see that voters perceive fraud as more of an issue. Um, in terms of the benefits for satisfaction with elections, we see that there doesn't seem to be a benefit at all. In fact, the, the overall effect seems to be negative. And, um, and it may be that this is the case because of the perceived increase in barriers uh, to election and election participation and fairness detract from the positive effect on resilience to fraud. So these effects are likely to be specific to the electorate in English local elections, which differs from general elections, of course, as everybody else has said. So thank you so much. Thank you, Petra. Um, uh, we'll, we'll move right along. We're making great good time. Um, we're going to move now uh, to one of our civil society um, organizations. So John Alt will be joining us from Democracy Volunteers and is going to be giving their assessment of the May local elections. So John, if you'd like to share your screen, um, you're welcome to get, get going. Can everyone see my slides? Yep, we can see it just fine. Good. Um, I assume Peter was going before me to so sort of give the view of the administrators, but nice to see you all. Um, I'm John Alt, I'm the Director of Democracy Volunteers, and, and to explain who we are, um, we are a civil society organisation. We've got about 350 accredited observers with the Electoral Commission, um, and we deploy two volunteers to each area we observe in. Uh, they're all trained, as I'll explain further, but essentially we're a voluntary organisation that tries to evaluate the quality of our democracy in the UK um, and then report back on it to people like uh, the people in this room. Um, and one of the things that might be surprising people, especially those international uh, people attending today, is why is this a problem? Surely the UK has no problem at all. This is a fairly normal activity, having ID. In fact, I think every other country in the OSCOD has ID requirements to vote. The problem is they have national ID card systems and we don't. And so we, well, that, one of the things that people like Toby, Phil, me and everyone else here has been trying to do is problematise why, who's this going to impact and what the problem is when it comes to uh, the election. So let me just go into it. So essentially, I'm going to sort you through four things. Um, our methodology that we conducted on... Uh, how we set up what we were going to do, what we actually did on the day, the things we found, and then some of the ideas we come up with. And that, that map there shows you um, the areas where there were elections on uh, May the 4th. As you can see, essentially, uh, lots of rural England um, and some of the big metropolises without any elections at all. So that's going to be very interesting when it happens next year. So all our observ observations follow internationally accepted methodology based on those uh, organised by the OSCOD and the Carter Centre as examples. Um, our observations are politically independent, our observers do not interfere with the electoral process at all. Although actually one of the things that election observers are allowed to do is interfere, uh, we don't because we think it meets the international standards. All, as I said, all our observers are accredited with the Electoral Commission. Um, we remember an organisation called GENDEM, which is a very big mouthful called the Global Network of Domestic Election Monitors, and we abide by a declaration of global principles for non-partisan election observation and monitoring by citizen organisations. Why these people come up with very long descriptions, I'll never know. But we play, we follow the rules that are internationally accepted. Um, and essentially, we maintain impartiality, independence. We try to be as accurate as we can, transparent as we can, and we try not to discriminate to what we do. Uh, we respect the rule of law, and we cooperate with all of the other electoral stakeholders and other international observers. In fact, we meet quite a lot of people in here prior to the election to talk about it. Um, as you can see, I mean, I think we actually met Toby, Phil, uh, and I think <laughs> Alistair before the election to talk about some of the problems that we were going to see uh, potentially with the introduction of voter ID. So 
just to explain how we do it, because it's interesting to see what um, Alastair was talking about training of election uh, staff. All our observers undertake a comprehensive training programme before acting as observers. This includes an online course, uh, but also followed up with uh, a training seminar with our head of training, Max Wheeler, before participating in pre-deployment briefing for their region. Uh, we believe that it really is important to explain exactly what we're looking for. And we have about a 40 question survey for them to complete at the end of the day. Following international standards, we always go around in two, sometimes threes of the driver, but essentially we have uh, the four eyes principle where two observers will observe together. Those observations last between 30 and 45 minutes, um, and the teams then report back follow each polling station to an online survey, and we collect that data throughout the day. Um, it, collect, it contains a number of questions relating to the issues previously seen at Elections UK, but also on this occasion, obviously, uh, with the questions around voter ID, we added those questions in this year. So what did we, where did we actually go? Um, we deployed a team of 150 across England, uh, generally teams of two, as I said, and they went to 118 of the 230 councils holding elections. You can see we went to every council in Devon, a lot in the Midlands, a lot in the southeast of England, and a lot in the north of England as well. And they collected data on a wide range of issues, such as the implementation of voter ID. Now, our full report is available on the website, so you're more than welcome to read it. But I think it's important to look at some of the, I think it's very interesting listening to, to the contributors today uh, and seeing this as sort of statistical questions that are being questioned. Asked, you know, we can speculate the 14,000 people are excluded. One of the things that we wanted to evaluate across the councils, and we also, there's the councils you can see uh, where we observed this year, um, was more about that sort of qualitative view rather than just the quantitative view, because I think actually who this is affecting, not just the numbers it's affecting, is an important part of this, this conversation. And I think, uh, Phil, that the, the Electoral Commission's initial report sort of reflects some of what we found, is that um, we went to over 50% of councils, but the, the important detail, I think, on this slide is that we um, consulted people like uh, uh, the Runnery Trust or the Diversity Trust before the election to, to identify ways without wanting to use pejorative language and also because we simply can't identify every single potential ethnic group voting, is how we can try and evaluate the types of people who are being more affected by this new policy than others. Um, and as you can see, we, we actually identified 1.2% of voters turned away. Why was that higher than the number that Phil's got? The answer is because we don't stay there all day to find out if they return in each case. So initially, 1.2% we saw turned away. But I'll tell you more about that data as well, because there's more in that than, than just the, the headline figure of those turned away in the polling station. We continue to see family voting, as, as Alice was talking about, we saw it in 17% of polling stations, though I can't actually see my data, well, it's from memory. Um, the 53% of people turned away who were non-white passing. We consulted with the Diversity Trust, which is an organisation that, that looks at the impacts of government policy on different groups. and we said, okay, how can we evaluate uh, the differences between communities? And they said, the easiest way for you to do this is to have white passing, people who look like me, and people who are not white passing, people who don't look like me. And so that was the way, now it's not perfect, and it's not you know, in any way an ideal methodology, but we wanted to do something which was you know, identify the, 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 you know, more of the, the diversity of the policy, not just the, the numbers behind it. And the fact that 53% of those people we saw turned away were non-white passing, I think is significant. Uh, the, they weren't, you know, lots of people, you know, all, as you'll discover, part of this is lots of people just simply don't have the ID requirements. So, uh, some of the sort of the more um, the detail behind this, and this is actually a, a conversation I was in myself in Wire Forest in the Midlands. Um, an elderly, uh, who are these policies actually impacting? An elderly LED entered with a guide dog, so obviously she doesn't have a driving license. Without wanting to be too blunt about it, she doesn't have a driving license. She's not been abroad uh, in years, she said. She didn't have a suitable ID to be allowed to wear, only photographed her with a dog. The staff were very apologetic, but after some time she simply left because you know she she was in her past 80s. She'd obviously always voted and was excluded because of this policy. Now, the policy is not, I think, arguable designed to prevent someone like that from voting but that person probably doesn't have the capacity to go online to apply for a bank um, and so there's got to be some thought about how someone like that is assisted to be able to vote in the future but then there are two cases which i think and that that person was was white passing by the way then there's this this next voter who was in st Albans, 
a couple had Pakistani photographic IDs, which was not accepted. The man was slightly irritated because he did not know it was invalid. Of course, it was valid because it's a Commonwealth passport. So this person was excluded despite having valid ID. So that's another consideration is that what is the mindset behind that person be excluded when that person if they'd looked at their notes looked at the guidance from the electoral commission would know that passport is valid and another lady uh, in peterborough uh, tried to vote with a pakistani passport and she was told it was not valid so there are three cases there uh, one of whom is someone with disability two people from ethnic minorities who were excluded because of this policy now I, I don't, not, none of those people, arguably the first person should be excluded they didn't have valid ID, but the second two people did have valid ID. And I think one of the concerns about this is the, the, the training that's going on to make sure that the people running polling stations um, actually know what is valid um, within the context of their polling station. So, I mean, as you can see, there's also some other considerations that, that others have raised. We saw meters and greeters uh, at 43 percent of polling stations and they invariably asked voters whether they had id with them before approaching the desk so there were some what we called in our report soft turnaways essentially people who were turned away long before they got to that another acronym uh, the, the official form that was produced by the election commission to record those people being excluded there were also 28 percent of polling stations have tellers now a teller to international audience are people who take numbers from polling from the voter to record them so they can tell their their party to, to go out and, and get them out later on and get out the vote prompt operation um and so some of those were asking people to have their id with them but just as a matter of course they were asking them have you got your id with you sort of conversation and so some of those would also turn people away. And then I think there's also the one that isn't mentioned, but is, is pretty blunt on the, our, the front page of our report, which is, is the, the election commission did a great job of actually increasing people's awareness of, of the policy. Part of this was done by having big signs outside polling stations, as you can see that one in Rochdale on the front page of our polling of our report. Um, and we identified signage at 94% of polling stations about ID. Importantly, 56% had signage outside. So whether there were tellers or not, there were lots of signs outside conversation saying, have you brought your ID with you? So another group of people would have been turned away softly without them making it to the desk. So I think some of the conversation around this has to be not just the data driven conversation, but something about what's going on in the sort of environs of polling stations as well. And, and just two things that we recommended to the electoral commission, I'm conscious I might not be up to my time, I speak too quickly, but in terms of data collection, it really is important, we think, that uh, hard to tell don't to ask members of the public whether they've got ID. Their role there is to, to, to get their own supporters out to take numbers, and they shouldn't be in a position to be well. Because let's be honest, it's quite an effective way of, of making sure the opposition don't vote if you ask them if they've got their ID and they don't. Um, the numbers turned away carried out by which it should be included in the ballot paper refusal list, which is the thing that's produced by the Electoral Commission. And training should be given to ensure no voters in the correct ID are mistakenly turned away. They may be statements of the blind and the obvious, but I think they're things that uh, people administering and legislating for elections need to understand, is that people turned away by a member of staff, whether at the desk or not, should be included in the data. Um, and bluntly, if we're going to have an ID system in the UK, it's got to be based on something that people easily access you know passports now are not cheap things driving license um, are not necessarily things people need to have if they don't you know drive let's be honest so i think essentially you've got to look at how you extend uh, the amounts the numbers of id and also particularly people um, who are younger because although you know i've had apocryphal conversations with people about older people being excluded there is a concern that younger people there's not equality between things like the oyster car bearing in mind next may we'll see elections in london where there's a differential between those two forms of id i know there's some conversation about the quality of those id but it's important i think that, that that's looked at before next may and um, i found happy to answer any questions after this but that's what we found and i hope you found it interesting thanks Thank you so much, John. Um, so we'll move to our final presentation now um, by Peter Stanion from the Association of Electoral Administrators to give us um, a view from the ground. Uh, so Peter, you can take it away. Thank you, Holly. Um, I have no slides to share with you. Uh, it's just my, frankly, not nice face to look at you as I actually speak to you. 
Um, but the reason being for that is partly because I wanted to hear what my other colleagues on the um, uh, session uh, gave in their presentations today, because what I'm going to give to you is a slightly different angle of it in terms of how was it delivered. Um, and uh, certainly some of the, the, the challenges around the uh, stats, the, the evaluations, et cetera, almost going conflict with the way that elections themselves are running polling stations. The association uh, of which I'm the chief executive, it basically represents those who push the buttons, deal with the paperwork, deliver the actual elections themselves. So I speak on behalf of, of those in the, the local authorities who, who actually deliver the elections uh, on behalf of their returning offices effectively. But I think the things I would start off by saying is certainly this was the biggest change in a generation. This came very late in the day, only four months out from these elections with the legislation in place. Uh, and that made it quite a challenging thing to, to deliver. Uh, two things to say there. One, it made it difficult for the Electoral Commission to produce the statutory guidance that, that always comes out of elections for organisations such as our own to develop training and the guidance that was required to go alongside that. But I think the key point that needs to be said is these elections were actually successfully delivered. Um, there were no major issues. I think um, there are a number of freedom of information requests made after the elections from the national media seeking the story of where it had gone wrong. And in every single election, and John makes reference to, to where things don't go quite right, generally speaking, there was nothing major that meant that the actual election uh, fell over. But I say that on the, with the background of the fact that these were low turnout elections with people who were generally engaged with the local political process in terms of delivering the elections. When we now get towards the UK parliamentary general election, which must happen before January of 2025, we are very much expecting this to be a far more challenging scenario. You've had stats thrown at you left, right and centre today, but 230 local authorities in England delivered the elections out of the 297 that are there. So it was the majority, but London, Birmingham, Bristol, huge areas did not run these elections with the diversity that comes into those sorts of things. Um, I gave evidence to a parliamentary committee yesterday, um, and one of the things I did say is that uh, effectively one of the beauties of the UK system is that failure is very difficult to happen because at a parliamentary election, there are 650 separate elections taking place. So if 10 MPs don't get elected, that's terrible, but it doesn't stop democracy happening in terms of the processes as we go forwards. So the endemic issues that we've reported on will always remain there until we can keep chipping away to get uh, the, the, the points uh, uh, raised. Alistair made a very interesting stat in terms of 15 to 19% of poll workers felt the law is too complicated. I think if you surveyed the electoral administrator to deliver elections, that percentage is probably likely to be slightly higher than that because of the, and the, the fact the law commissions in the UK have actually recommended significant changes to, to process. So let me go to, to where we're, we're at. Um, I think it's fair to say in every local authority, I use the word over-engineered. It wasn't over-engineered. It was basically risk management went into overdrive to make sure that ultimately the election could be delivered safely. It wasn't just in the polling stations. I'll touch on that in a second. But the point being made, and certainly in the commission's report that the Phil uh, referred to, interesting statistic there, just under 90,000 applications were made for voter authority certificates in the run-up to the actual elections themselves whereas only 25,000 were used in polling stations. So the big gap between those who applied and those who actually then went into the actual polling station uh, to vote, I think um, the, the figure that was being expected was closer to a quarter of a million VAX to be uh, processed uh, as we run up to the election. That didn't happen, and it allowed for the development of the actual application process to be developed in generally the 230 local authorities, but in fact, one of the highest areas of response was Bristol, which didn't actually have elections this time around. A lot of work being done on that. The key point, I think, in terms of the biggest change is, is the communications. And again, going back to the Electoral Commission statistics, um, just at the point of uh, notice of election being published, 57% awareness of voter ID, 87% by polling day, up to 92% post polling day. But interestingly, yesterday in the same evidence session that I gave uh, in, in the House of Commons, uh, there'd been a by-election in one of the local authorities where actually few, there was a higher percentage of people did not bring their ID with them at that by-election. So there needs to be that constant communications out there. Till we get it into the UK electors' psyche, they need to bring with them that ID. Interestingly, 
there are demographics within um, uh, the UK society where ID is almost expected, whereas because it is that big sea change that, as I think John made the reference to, uh, it's almost unexpected. Why, why have we not had it previously? Well, it is a big change that's coming through. And the big danger, I think, going into the UK Parliamentary General will be the fact that the, forgive the terminology, the disengaged, those who do not vote in local elections, will actually come out to vote in parliamentary elections. And we're expecting there to be, um, albeit with all the communications that go around it, challenges as individuals arrive at stations without the requisite ID because they don't vote except once every four or five years at parliamentary elections. So the sort of challenges there, one of the, the one of the things that was, was was sort of been well known within the, the electoral industry, for want of a better phrase, is the fact 230 local authorities meant there were, uh, if I do my maths right, 67 areas who were able to share their staff. A significant proportion, and again, I, I will quote Bournemouth Council, Bournemouth Christchurch and Poole in the south of England, they have actually stated on the record they could only run their elections because they borrowed the majority, 40% of their staff came from Bath City Council next door to them who did not have elections. Regardless of it being a parliamentary election coming um, before uh, January 25, there will be a national poll on the 2nd of May next year when the Police and Crime Commissioner elections and the London mayoral elections and assembly will take place. So they will not be able to do that sharing. So there's a big challenge being built in on an endemic issue that's already there within our system of the availability of those volunteers to help. Um, totally take on board the sort of the, the points that John picked up on in the report, which is a very good read to understand what was going on in those areas. And the three examples he gave, totally agree with him. The first one, very little that can be done in terms of the polling stations about the applications process and the engagement with, 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 with electors in that scenario. The issue with regards to the Commonwealth passports shouldn't have happened. They are trained on it. But I think it's in, it actually demonstrates the pressures that have come in to those volunteers in polling stations. I stress that point. If you talk to an electoral core team, and again, feedback that I received yesterday, was the uh, account that was done in that by-election by the Electoral Services core team was done far more efficiently than by the volunteers who count normally because they, it's their job, 365 days a year, 24 hours. When you bring those volunteers in, which you need to do, more and more responsibility has been uh, levelled onto those individuals, which is a major risk. But uh, incrementally, risk is being brought into the process. And one of the major issues around that, for example, was the reporting mechanisms. Um, and, and Phil will know, having been fully involved in terms of the actual guidance, the, the, the paperwork to be completed, um, I think it's fair to say in some areas the completion was far better than in others, simply because people were swamped with that paperwork on top of the standard work they had to do uh, in, in advance as far as that was concerned. So that's something to factor in about how easy is it for those staff their primary responsibility in mine and my organisation's right is to run a safe and secure election. The fact that reporting takes place afterwards is needed, but that is secondary to the safe delivery of the actual election uh, as, it, as it works its way through. There was lots of work done around about accessibility, privacy screens, um, removal of face coverings that actually didn't really transpire in stations even in the areas where you'd expect there to be more of a demographic need to, to do so. But that work was done. I absolutely applaud John for making the point with regards to the, the, the information being given by the party volunteers outside of polling stations. Have you got your ID? Whether that was for political reasons or, or not, it didn't help in many respects actually explaining what people need to bring along because we are aware where individuals came along, were advised to go back and get their ID and brought the wrong ID with them as a result of that through the advice they've been given from outside the polling stations. I think one of the things around, and this is where I'm sort of slightly, you know, um, in terms of the statistical analysis is really important, but one thing that seems to have been slightly overlooked with the greeters at polling stations is the fact that was a reaction to help in a customer service way individuals coming into a polling station it became a very big issue in terms of people being turned away because they're, they're, there's, there's voter suppression etc that was, could not be further from the truth whether that reporting is possible in future elections for greeters to actually report that into the desks and for, for more robust statistics to be produced remains to be seen and that's obviously the conversations the electoral commission the government will have about safe delivery in stations. But the one thing I do want to make the point is that those greeters were there 
to help. They were not there to hinder. And in some respects, that seems to have been slightly forgotten in that respect. Um, conscious that the time's coming uh, very quickly to to uh, to close on this, but I think one thing will be very interesting as we go forwards now will be the three parliamentary by elections that are taking place on the twentieth of July. Uh, so only a uh, couple of weeks away, um, where there'll be some very high profile um, uh, vacancies caused by very high profile individuals. I think I will leave it hanging there as far as that uh, is concerned. This is the first test at a higher level election we it won't be 70 percent. it won't be 80 percent, or very unlikely to be but it will be above the 50s we're absolutely sure of that certainly in in the hillingdon seat uh that that is being being uh, elected to so again another good test and that is in an area that particular one the the former prime minister's seat where they did not have a local elections in may it's the first time they have rolled out because it is a london seat as far as that is concerned i think the only thing i'd sort of uh, sort of uh, finalised with is that going back to my original point it was delivered well it did work it's worked in a lower case we cannot take our eye off the ball lots of good practice needs to be shared how was it delivered what were the success stories what wouldn't you do again so that again one of our one of our primary aims the commission certainly on this as well is in terms of sharing that good practice to make sure the voter experience does not change I'll leave you with one actual slight anecdote, uh, which I found quite, um, uh, made, me, made me smile, is that queues, um, one of my previous speakers mentioned queues at polling stations and there was an evidence that they were slightly higher. One of the factors was that, and I witnessed this in a polling station I actually went to, 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 to observe in, is that electors came and either came with their passport in their hand and showed it directly to the staff, whisked through the process. Or they came along, and much is the case at a supermarket checkout, put the bag on the desk, took out the purse, searched around for their uh, driver's license, showed the driver's license, then put the thing back in the bag. In the meantime, the people behind were queuing up. That is actually one of the big factors that needs to be worked through to try to avoid unnecessary queuing. The queuing can only be as a result of their being issued at the stations themselves. But Practitioners delivered really well, and I think across the, across the speed, the story was not voter ID. They were searching for that story about it being a barrier. At the end of the day, it was delivered well, but there's a huge challenge coming up when the parliamentary general election comes along at 25 working days notice, and I've not even touched on the second phase of the Elections Act with the additional pressures that will come into polling stations at that stage. So I don't think this story has gone away quite yet, but... There you go, Holly. That's the practitioner's view.